Hello Year 6, welcome back to my YouTube channel where I will be reading chapter 5 of the Boy in the Stripe Pajamas. Now, in chapter 4 we learned what Gretel and Bruno saw outside of their window and I don't know about you but I really didn't like the sound of some of the things that they saw. They could see barbed wire, they could see hooks, they described it as a nasty looking place. We also saw lots of people, boys, older looking boys, grand grandfathers, fathers, maybe uncles. So I wonder what that is all about. Let's move on to chapter five and see what is happening next in the story. So this chapter is called Out of Bounds at All Times and No Exceptions. And I remember from earlier in the story, that that is how Bruno described his father's office. Maybe that's what this chapter is all about. There was only one thing for it, and that was to speak to father. Father hadn't left Berlin in the car with them that morning. Instead, he had left a few days earlier on the night of the day that Bruno had come home to find Maria going through his things even the things he'd, he'd hidden at the back that belonged to him and were nobody else's business. In the days following, Mother, Gretel, Maria, Cook, Lars and Bruno had spent all their time boxing up their belongings and loading them into a big truck to be brought to their new home at Pentwith. It was on this final morning when the house looked empty and not like their real home at all. Very last things they owned were put into suitcases and an official car with red and black flags on the front had stopped at their door to take them away. Mother, Maria and Bruno were the last people to leave the house and it was Bruno's belief that mother didn't realise the maid was still standing there because as they took one last look around the empty hallway where they had spent so many happy times the place where the Christmas tree stood in December, the place where wet umbrellas were left to stand during the winter months, the place where Bruno was supposed to leave his muddy shoes when he came in but never did. Mother had shaken her head and said something very strange. We should never have let the fury come to dinner, she said. Some people and their determination to get ahead. Hmm. I wonder who the fury is. Just after she said that, she turned around and Bruno could see that she had tears in her eyes. She jumped when she saw Maria standing there watching her. Maria, she said in a startled tone of voice, I thought you were in the car. I was just leaving, ma'am, said Maria. I didn't mean, began mother, before shaking her head and starting again. I wasn't trying to suggest. I was just leaving, ma'am, repeated Maria. She must have known the rule about not interrupting mother and stepped through the door quickly and ran through the car. Mother had frowned, then shrugged, as if none of it really mattered anymore anyway. Come on then, Bruno, she said, taking his hand and locking the door behind them. Let's just hope we get to come back here someday when this is all over. The official car with the flags on the front had taken them to the train station where there were two tracks separated by a wide platform and on either side a train stood waiting for the passengers to board. Because there were so many soldiers marching about on the other side, not to mention the fact that there was a long hop belonging to the signalman separating the tracks, Bruno could only make out the crowds of people a few moments before he and his family boarded a very comfortable train with very few people on it and plenty of empty seats and fresh air when the windows were pulled down. If the trains had been going in different directions he thought it wouldn't have seemed so odd but they weren't. They were both pointed eastwards. For a moment he considered running, running across the platform to tell the people about the empty seats in his carriage he decided not to, as something told him that didn't make Mother angry. It would 
probably make Gretel furious and that would be worse still. Since arriving at Outwith in their new house, Bruno hadn't seen his father. He had thought perhaps he was in his bedroom earlier when the door creaked open, but that had turned out to be the unfriendly young soldier who had stared at Bruno without any warmth in his eyes. He hadn't heard father's booming voice anywhere, and he hadn't heard the heavy sounds of his boots on the floorboards downstairs. There were definitely people coming and going, and he debated what to do for the best. He heard a traffic commotion coming from downstairs and went to the hallway to look over the banister. Down below, he saw the door to father's office standing open and a group of five men outside it, laughing and shaking their heads. Father was at the centre of them and looked very smart in his freshly pressed uniform. His thick dark hair had obviously been recently lacquered and combed and as Bruno watched from up above he felt both scared and in awe of him. He didn't like, he didn't like the look of the other men quite as much. They certainly weren't, weren't as handsome as father nor were their uniforms as freshly pressed nor were their voices so booming or their boots so polished. They all held their caps under their arms and seemed to be fighting with each other for father's attention. Bruno could only understand a few of their phrases as they traveled up to him. Made mistakes from the moment he got here. It got to the point where the fury had no choice but to be, said one. Discipline, said another, and efficiency. We have lacked efficiency since the start of 42 and without that, it's clear, it's clear what the numbers say, it's clear commandant, said the third. And if we build another, said the last, imagine what we could do then, just imagine it. Father held a hand in the air, which immediately caused the other men to feel all silent. It was as if he was the conductor of a barbershop quartet. Gentlemen, he said, and this time Bruno could make out every word because there had never been a man born who was more capable of being heard from one side of a room to the other than father. Your suggestions and your encouragement are very much appreciated. And the past is the past. Here we have a fresh beginning. Let that beginning start tomorrow. For now, I'd better help my family settle in or there will be as much trouble for me in here as there is for them out there. You understand? The men all broke into laughter and shook father's hand. As they left, they stood in a row together like toy, sol toy soldiers and their arms shot out in the same way that father had got Bruno to look. The palms stretched flat, moving from their chests up into the air in front of them. In a sharp motion as they cried out the two words that Bruno had been taught to say whenever anyone said it to him. Then they left and father returned to his office, which was out of bounds at all times and no exceptions. Bruno walked slowly down the stairs and hesitated for a moment outside the door. He felt sad that Father had not come up to say hello to him in the hour or so that he had been there, by right, being here. It had just been explained to him on many occasions just how busy father was and that he couldn't be disturbed by silly things like saying hello to him all the time. The soldiers had left now and he thought it would be all right if he knocked on the door. Back in Berlin, Bruno had been inside father's office on only a handful of occasions. And it was usually because he had been naughty and needed to have a serious talking to. However, the rule that applied to father's office in Berlin was one of the most important rules that Bruno had ever learned. And he was not so silly as to think it would not apply here in Outwith. Since they had not seen each other in some days, he thought that no one would mind if he knocked at night. And so he tapped carefully on the door ice and quietly. Perhaps father didn't hear, perhaps Bruno didn't knock quite loudly enough. But no one came to the door, so Bruno knocked again, but did it louder this time. 
And as he did, so he entered the booming, he heard the booming voice from inside call out. And er, Bruno turned the door handle and stepped inside and assumed his customary pose of wide open eyes, mouth in the shape of a no and arms out, outstretched by his sides. The rest of the house might have been a little dark, gloomy and hardly full of possibilities for exploration. This room, this room was something else. It had a very high ceiling to begin with and a carpet underfoot that Bruno thought he might sink into. Walls were hardly visible. Instead, they were covered with dark mahogany shelves all lined with books, like the ones in the library at the house in Berlin. There were enormous windows on the wall facing him, which stretched out into the garden beyond, allowing a comfortable seat to be placed in front of them. And in the centre of all this, seated behind a massive oak desk, was father himself. He looked up from his papers when Bruno entered and broke into a wide smile. Bruno, he said, coming round from behind the desk and shaking the boy's hand solidly. The father was not usually the type of man to give anyone a hug, unlike mother and grandmother. He gave them a little too often for comfort, complimenting them with slobbering kisses. My boy, he added just after a moment. Hello, father, said Bruno quietly, a little overawed by the splendour of the room. Bruno, I was coming up to see you in a few minutes, I promise I was said father. I just had a meeting to finish and a letter to write. You got here safely then? Yes, father, said Bruno. You were a help to your mother and sister in closing the house? Yes, father, said Bruno. Then I am proud of you, said father approvingly. Sit down, boy. He indicated a wide armchair facing his desk and Bruno clambered onto it. His feet, his feet not quite touching the floor, while father returned to his seat behind the desk and stared at him. They didn't, see, didn't say anything to each other for a moment. And then finally, father broke the silence. So, he asked, what do you think? What do I think? asked Bruno. What do I think of what? Your new home. You like it? No, said Bruno quickly because he always tried to be honest and knew that if he hesitated even for a moment he wouldn't have the nerve to say what he really thought. I think we should go home, he added bravely. Father's smile faded only a little and he glanced down at his letter for a moment before looking back up again as if he wanted to consider his reply carefully. Well, we are home, Bruno. He said finally in a gentle voice. Out with is our new home. When can we go back to Berlin? asked Bruno, his heart sinking when father said that. It's so much nicer there. Come, come, said father, wanting to have none, none of that. Let's have none of that, he said. A home is not a building or a street or a city or something so artificial as brick and mortar. A home is where one's family is. Isn't that right? Yes, but and our family is here, Bruno, and out with. Ergo, this must be our home. Bruno didn't understand what ergo meant. But he didn't need to because he had a clever answer for father. But grandfather and grandmother are in Berlin, he said, and they're our family too, so this can't be our home. Father considered this and nodded his head. He waited a long time before replying. Yes, Bruno, they are. But you and I and Mother and Gretel are the most important people in our family, and this is where we live now, at Outwith. Now, don't look so unhappy about it, as Bruno was looking distinctly unhappy about it. You haven't given it a chance yet. You might like it here. I don't like it here, insisted Bruno. Bruno, said father in a tired voice. 
Bard's not here and Daniel's not here and Martin's not here and there are no other houses around us and no fruit and vegetable stalls and no streets and no cafes with tables outside. No one to push you from pillar to post on a Saturday afternoon. Bruno, sometimes there are things we need to do in life we didn't have a choice in, said father. And Bruno could tell that he was starting to tire of this conversation. And I'm afraid this is one of them. This is my work. And I'm afraid this isn't one of them. This is my work, important work, important to our country, important to the fury. You'll understand that someday. I want to go home, said Bruno. He could feel tears welling up behind his eyes and wanted nothing more than for father to realise just how awful a place Outwith really was and agree that it was time to leave. You need to realise that you are home, are at home, he said, disappointing Bruno. This is it for the foreseeable future. Bruno closed his eyes for a moment. Hadn't been many times in his life when he had been quite so insistent on having his own way, and he had certainly never gone to father with quite so much desire for him to change his mind about something. The idea of staying here, the idea of having to live in such a horrible place where there was no one at all to play with, was just too much to think about. When he opened his eyes again a moment later, Father stepped round from behind his desk and settled himself in an armchair beside him. Bruno watched as he opened a silver case, took out a cigarette and tapped it on the desk before lighting it. I remember when I was a child, said father, there were certain things I didn't want to do when my father said it would, it would be better for everyone if I did them, I just put my best foot forward and got on with them. What kinds of things, asked Bruno. Oh, I don't know, said father, shrugging his shoulders. It's neither here nor there anyway. I was just a child and I didn't know what was the best. Sometimes, for example, I didn't want to stay at home and finish my schoolwork. I wanted to be out on the streets playing with my friends, just like you do. And I look back now and see how foolish I was. So you know how I feel, said Bruno, hopefully. Yes, I also know that my father, your grandfather, knew what was best for me and that I was always happiest when I just accepted that. Do you think that I would have made such a success of my life if I hadn't learned when to argue and when to keep my mouth shut and follow orders? Well, Bruno, do you? Bruno looked around. His gaze landed on the window in the corner of the room and through it he could see the awful landscape beyond. Did you do something wrong? He asked after a moment. Something that made the fury angry. Me? Said father, looking at him in surprise. What do you mean? Well, did you do something bad at work? I know that everyone says you're an important man and that the fury has big things in mind for you. But he'd hardly send you to a place like this if you hadn't done something he wanted to punish you for. Father laughed which upset Bruno even more. There was nothing that made him more angry than when a grown-up laughed at him for not knowing something, especially when he was trying to find out the answer to asking questions. You don't understand the significance of such a position, father said. Well, I don't think you can have been very good at your job if it means we all have to move away from a very nice home and our friends and come to a horrible place like this. I think you must have done something wrong and you should go and apologise to the Fury. And maybe that will be an end to it. Maybe he'll forgive you if you're very sincere about it. Words were out before he could really think about whether they were sensible or not. Once he had heard them floating in the air, it didn't seem like entirely the things, the kind of things he should be saying to Father. There they were, already said. And not a thing he could do to take them back. Bruno swallowed nervously and after a few moments silence glanced back at father who was staring at him stony faced. Bruno licked his lips and looked away. He felt it would be a bad idea to hold father's eye. 
After a few silent and uncomfortable minutes, Father stood up slowly from his seat behind him and walked behind the desk, laying his cigarette on an ashtray. I wonder if you are being very brave, he said quietly after a moment, as if he was debating the matter in his head, rather than merely disrespectful. Perhaps that's not such a bad thing. I didn't mean that you will be quiet now, said Father, raising his voice and interrupting him, because none of the rules of normal family life ever applied to him. I have been very considerate about your feelings, Bruno, because I know that this move is difficult for you. And I have listened to what you've had to say, even though your youth and experience push you to phrase things in an insolent manner. And you'll notice that I have not reacted to any of this. But the moment has come when you have, will simply have to accept it. I don't want to accept it, shouted Bruno, thinking in surprise because he hadn't known he was going to shout out loud. In fact, it came as a complete surprise to him. He tensed slightly and got ready to make a run for it if necessary. Nothing seemed to be making Father angry today. And if Bruno was honest with himself, he would have admitted that Father rarely became angry. He became quiet and distant and always had his way in the end anyway. And rather than shouting at him or chasing him around the house, he simply shook his head and indicated their debate was at an end. Go to your room, Bruno, he said in such a quiet voice that Bruno knew that he meant business now. So he stood up, tears of frustration forming in his eyes. He walked towards the door, but before opening it, he turned round and asked one final question. Father, he began. Bruno, I am not going to, began Father irritably. It's not about that, said Bruno quite quickly. I just have one other question. Father sighed, but indicated that he should ask it, and then that would be the end to the matter and no argument. Bruno thought about his question, wanting to phrase it exactly right this time, just in case it came out as being rude or uncooperative. Who are all those people outside? He said finally. Father tilted his head to the left, looking a little confused by the question. Soldiers, Bruno, he said, and secretaries, staff workers, you've seen them all before, of course. No, not them, said Bruno. The people I see from my window, in the huts, in the distance, they're all dressed the same. Ah, those people said father, nodding his head, smiling slightly. Those people, well, not people at all, Bruno. Bruno frowned. They're not, he asked, unsure what father meant by that. Well, at least not as we understand the term, father continued. But you shouldn't be worrying about them right now. They're nothing to do with you. You have nothing whatsoever in common with them. Settle into your new home and be good, that's all I ask. Accept the situation in which you find yourself and everything will be so much easier. Yes, Father, said Bruno, unsatisfied by the response. He opened the door and Father called him back for a moment, standing up and raising an eyebrow as if he'd forgotten something. Bruno remembered the moment his father made the signal and said the phrase and imitated him exactly pushed his two feet together and shot his right arm into the air before clicking his two heels together and saying in as deep and clear a voice as possible, as much like fathers as he could manage, the words he said every time he left the soldier's presence. Heil Hitler, he said, which he presumed was another way of saying, well, goodbye for now, have a pleasant afternoon. And that is the end of chapter five. So in this chapter, we have found a little bit more about father and actually some clues about what his father's job is. We knew that it was a very important job and we knew that we, he had to move house because of this important job. We know that he's a commandant, that he is 
kind of like a boss to some of the soldiers in Eichwith. And he didn't really give a straight answer when Bruno was asking about the people that he could see out through his window. If you remember, he said, they're not really people at all, which was a very strange answer. Just right at the end, we had another clue as to what father does, because he said the word Heil Hitler. And we know who Hitler is, don't we? Yes. And maybe what you could do is you could go and do a little bit of research about Hitler and the soldiers and what they did in World War II. So I think we'll leave it there for now because we are going to find out a lot more about the story when we look at chapter six. So I hope you enjoyed that reading of chapter five and I will see you again very soon when I read chapter six. Being safe everyone, lots of love.